This is the fourth video in the Edexcel C3 revision tutorial series. Today we will be looking at the creation of soluble salts as well as how to carry out titrations. In today's video we will look at what an acid base titration is as well as what we mean by a neutralization. We will look at how to carry out a simple acid base titrations using indicators. We will look at how we can prepare a salt from a soluble base using a neutralization reaction. And finally, we will calculate concentrations of solutions using the results from a titration. Before we move on to look at titrations, just a brief recap from Edexcel C1, where you'll have looked at acids and alkalis. Here we have some very, very common acids and alkalis. On the acid side, we have hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, and sulfuric acid. We have HCl, HNO3, and H2SO4. On the alkali side, we have a series of hydroxides. We have sodium, potassium, magnesium, and calcium hydroxide. From this, it is very easy to see that all of the alkalis share a common OH group. This OH group is the hydroxide group. This is what makes an alkali into an alkali. On the flip side, all of the acids contain a positive hydrogen ion, the H plus ion. We will look at H and OH groups in more detail as we move through this lesson. When we are examining whether a liquid is an acid or an alkali, we can use the pH scale. This is something I'm sure you're already familiar with. The universal indicator can be used to give us a nice clear range. We have very strong acids down at 1, 2 and 3 pH, up to very strong alkalis at 13 to 14 pH with water which is neutral in the middle. As we stated on the previous slide, all acids contain hydrogen ions, the H plus ion, whereas alkalis contain hydroxide ions, the OH minus ions. It is this combination of H plus and OH minus ions which make water neutral. Water, which is H2O, as I'm sure you're aware, is made up of a H plus ion and an OH minus ion. This gives it a ratio of 1 to 1, making it neutral. When an acid and an alkali react together, they will neutralise each other. Again, this is something you'll have looked at previously. If we take the hydrochloric acid and the sodium hydroxide, they will react together. The sodium will replace the hydrogen in the HCl, giving us NaCl, sodium chloride or common table salt, as well as the water. It is this creation of the water that makes it a neutralisation. So overall, we have our H+, plus, which is aqueous, plus our OH-, minus, also aqueous, going to our H2O, which is liquid. This is where acids and alkalis then link to titrations. When we carry out a titration, we are carrying out a neutralisation reaction. The point of doing a titration is to find out exactly how much acid is needed to neutralise a quantity of alkali, or vice versa. So we could look at how much alkali is needed to neutralise a known quantity of acid. Before we look at the calculations for these, we need to recap how to carry out a titration safely. In order to carry out a titration, you need to get a selection of equipment. First of all, you have your burette in the burette stand. This is where you will put in your sodium hydroxide. It is important to remember to fill the burette below eye level. This is for two reasons. First of all, that it is a lot safer, as if it spills, it will be going onto the floor, not coming down onto your face. And secondly, you will be able to accurately measure it out with more accuracy. Then you need to measure out your 25 centimeters cubed of your acid. In order to do this, you will use a pipette. Pipetting out your volume of acid, in this case 25 centimetres cubed. This then goes into the conical flask. Into the conical flask you then need to add in your indicator. In this case we are going to use phenolphthalein. Phenolphthalein is a good indicator to use for a weak acid and a strong alkali. It has a very, very distinctive colour change. You will then slowly add the alkali until the mixture in the flask turns pink. In this case, dropping the base down the burette 
by letting out a little bit at a time. Phenolphthalein is a colourless liquid in acid, however in alkali it goes a very, very distinctive pink colour. This means that after adding a small amount of the alkali, we need to fully stir it to see if we get a constant pink colour. We then record the volume down in order to work out the volume of alkali used to neutralise the acid. With all titrations, it is best to carry out a rough first titration the first time. This will give you an idea of the vague amount of alkali or acid that you will need in order to carry out the neutralisation. You can then carry out three more repeats that will be more accurate. There are a selection of indicators that you can use. However, as a general rule of thumb, we do not use universal indicator as it is very difficult to tell accurately when the reaction is over due to it having a full range of colours rather than one distinctive colour change. In order to decide on the correct indicator, it depends on the relative strengths of your acid and alkali. If you are using a strong acid and strong alkali, you can use any of the indicators below. For a strong acid and a weak alkali, we use methyl orange. For a weak acid and weak alkali, it is best to use phenolphthalein. And then finally, for a strong alkali and a weak acid, we can use litmus solution. We can also use phenolphthalein for this strong alkali and weak acid. When you have worked out the amount of alkali or acid that you have used to neutralise, you can then carry out a titration equation calculation. The equation that you need is the number of moles is equal to the concentration times the volume, or we can use the appearing triangle. Where we have M, which is the moles, C for concentration, and V for volume. A question in the exam might look as follows. So from a titration, you find that you need 32.5 centimetres cubed of hydrochloric acid to neutralise 25 cm cubed of 0.5 moles per dm cubed calcium hydroxide solution. Find the concentration of the acid. This question is one that we need to do in three steps. For step one, we need to work out the number of moles of the known substance we've got. In this question, that would be the calcium hydroxide solution. So we'll do the number of moles of calcium hydroxide is equal to the concentration times the volume. So we do our moles equals concentration times volume. We've got our moles of 0.5, which we were given here, and we have also gone, been given our volume of 25 cm cubed. We need to convert this into dm cubed, so 25 divided by 1,000. This gives us an answer of 0.0125 moles of calcium hydroxide. In step two, we first need to write down the equation for the reaction. We then need to work out how many moles of the hydrochloric acid we have. So our overall equation is our CaOH2 plus our HCl goes to calcium chloride, CaCl2, plus our water. The balanced equation being CaOH2 plus 2HCl goes to CaCl2 plus 2H2O. From this equation, we can see that for every one calcium hydroxide, we have two hydrochloric acids. We have a 1 to 2 ratio. However, we do not have 1 mole of calcium hydroxide. Instead, we have 0.0125 moles. However, we must have double the number of moles for hydrochloric acid due to the 1 to 2 ratio. So we're going to do our 0.0125 moles, timesing it by 2 to give us 0.025 moles of hydrochloric acid. We have now got our moles of our hydrochloric acid as well as our volume. However, this is a volume in centimetres cubed, so we will need to convert it to dm cubed. However, we are now ready for step 3, which is to work out the concentration of HCl. 
Using the above equation, we are now going to work out the concentration. So we're going to do our moles divided by our volume. So this will be our 0.025 divided by our 32.5, which we need to convert into dm cubed. So 32.5 divided by 1,000, which will give us an overall concentration of 0.77 moles per dm cubed, which we can see here. Here we have another question. So 0.05 dm cubes of HCl neutralizes 0.1 dm cubed of NaOH of concentration 0.5 mole per dm cubed. What is the concentration of the acid? I want you to pause the video and using the steps that we previously looked at, I want you to work out the concentration of the acid. So in this question, we had to work out the number of moles of sodium hydroxide. We'd been given a 0.5 moles per dm cubed solution and a 0.1 dm cubed volume. So we have a moles of 0.05 moles. In the equation, we can see that one HCl neutralizes one sodium hydroxide, so it's a one-to-one -one ratio, meaning that our moles of HCl must also be 0.05. We then need to put this into the equation using our volume of 0.05 dm cubed to give us a concentration of the acid of 1 mole per dm cubed. We have now looked over how to safely carry out a titration as well as how to carry out titration equation calculations. We will now look at the final topic for today's video which is preparing soluble salts. In order to make a soluble salt, there are two ways that you need to know. The first of which is using an acid and an insoluble reactant, and then secondly, using an acid and a soluble reactant. In both cases, these are neutralization reactions. The first method we will look at is creating a soluble salt via the use of an acid and an insoluble reactant. In this case, we're going to be using an acid and an insoluble base. Insoluble bases include metal carbonates and metal oxides. To look over the solubility of different metal compounds, look back to the videos on Edexcel C2. First of all, we're going to add the base to the acid. The solid will dissolve in the acid as it reacts. We know when the acid has been neutralised because excess solid sinks to the bottom of the flask. In order to end up solely with the soluble salt, we then need to filter out the excess solid. This will mean that we've got a solution containing only the salt and water. In order to end up only with our soluble salt, we then need to remove the water. By far the easiest way to do this is just to evaporate off the water by heating it gently. This will then remove the water and crystallise the salt. An example of this is the addition of copper oxide to hydrochloric acid to make copper chloride. As we can use excess base in order to ensure the reaction is completed, it is very, very simple to make our soluble salt using this method. We will now look at a slightly more complicated method, which is when we use an acid and a soluble reactant. Making a soluble salt using an acid and a soluble reactant is more difficult than with an acid and an insoluble reactant. However, it is necessary in order to make salts using sodium, potassium or via the use of ammonium hydroxides. The issue with the acid and soluble reactant is that we cannot tell when the reaction has finished as we do not have an insoluble product to form on the bottom of the flask. Because of this, we have to use an indicator to tell us when it has been neutralised. However, the indicator could contaminate the salt, so we need to first carry out a titration in order to find out the exact amount of alkali needed to neutralise the acid. We can then carry out the reaction a second time using exactly the right proportions of alkali and acid. This will ensure that the reaction has completed. Once you have carried out this reaction for the second time, you then need to evaporate the water off as you did previously. This is because the solution after the neutralisation will contain only the salt and the water. 
we can then evaporate off this water in order to leave us with the dry crystalled salt. An example of this is the reaction between sulfuric acid and sodium hydroxide to make sodium sulfate. This concludes this episode of the Edexcel C3 revision tutorial series. In the next episode, which will be episode 5, we will look at electrolysis before moving on to electroplating.